Hi everybody, this is Todd Krieger. Today's topic is from crisis to connection, overcoming challenges in healing after infidelity. I work uh, more than anything else with uh, couples and individuals who have been affected by infidelity, both the person who betrayed and the person who was betrayed. Um, I do other things as well, but uh, probably more than anything, that is what I do. And uh, I have developed a passion for helping couples heal from infidelity. Now, not every couple will heal from infidelity. It takes basically more than anything, uh, both people willing to put on the psychological x-ray glasses and take a much closer look at themselves and each other. It's hard to do at first because people are very hurt. And of course, when I start working with couples, I have to start with right where they're at. There's a lot of pain, a lot of anguish, a lot of shock with the betrayed person. There's also probably panic and possibly some um, immature parts of the other person that might be more concerned about getting caught and really paying attention to the pain that they caused the other person. But my job is to help uh, that be uh, temporary and so that people can grow into who they really can be. As I've said so many times before, infidelity is not a good thing. It's a very hurtful thing. It's a terrible thing. It, uh, it can destroy lives. It can destroy uh, families. But it also, if done right, can help people, uh, once they overcome that challenge of this infidelity, to have much greater connection than they might have had before. You know, one of the things that I've uh, realized more than anything else is that many of us come from families where we didn't have the best of what we call secure connections with our parents. And it's not our parents' fault because they probably didn't have that with their parents. And it's not really about blaming anybody. It's just really realizing that, uh, that there's an evolutionary force that is here that we need to kind of join forces with and realize that we need to learn how to connect more deeply through pain as well as through pleasure, through heaven and hell, as I say. Um, I've, I've uh, talked to and read from neurobiologists that say basically uh, that the key to having a very uh, dynamic, healthy relationship is when two people can learn how to regulate each other's autonomic nervous system. Now, what that means is that we need to learn how to regulate each other from a more stressed state to a less stressed state, which oftentimes comes from really healthy communication, good listening, uh, and overall, of course, emotional support and caring, but it's where the communication, the ability to listen, that's where a lot of us fall short because we haven't seen it much in a family. People even that come to me and say, oh, I had a great background, my family was great. Uh, the, you, you start to look a little closer and you find that many of these people that say that even though their families took care of them and they, they, they did a lot of wonderful things, that maybe what they didn't do was sit down and listen to them with their feelings. And so they, uh, they don't develop a secure connection. Uh, the, what happens is when the parent isn't able to regulate themselves well, they on some level need the child to behave a certain way to keep them regulated. And this is a continuum. It's not a black and white thing. Some people are really excellent at regulating themselves, meaning that they can now afford to give their children freedom to, to become who they are. And for some, it's really not. They're just so unregulated that they actually end up uh, giving the child the message that you're here to regulate me. Now, it is not a conscious message but they become less and less of themselves. Now, why am I talking about that when I'm talking about a video about uh, from crisis to connection, overcoming challenges in healing after infidelity? It's because I have found that more times than not, almost 100% of the time, I have, when I trace back what really happened with this couple where they're dealing with infidelity, is that uh, the portrayed person, uh, I should say the person who betrayed oftentimes had really faulty connections in that way, that they weren't allowed to be who they were. 
so they develop inadequate ways of regulating themselves that's why people do drugs they do drugs to regulate themselves now you regulate them down which i just started to talk about and then i distracted myself regulating themselves down is when you calm someone down from a more stress state to a more calm state but there's also regulating up from um, maybe a more uh, deadened or bored state to more alivened, more exciting, more passionate, more intense state. So when people tend to use, for example, weed, it's a way oftentimes to regulate down for the most part, calm themselves down. When people use cocaine, is to regulate themselves up typically, to make them feel alive, to make up for their, their boredom or their emptiness or their lethargy. Well, infidelity also is a way to, to regulate one's energy oftentimes. Sometimes it's to get away from stress and to calm themselves down. Sometimes they, uh, it's an adventure and they regulate themselves up. Now, when I work with couples that uh, don't have that capacity to downregulate and upregulate each other on a regular basis, which are many, many couples, um, and that one of them, if not both, but usually one partner has then used infidelity to do that, then it's important for me to help them understand that that's part of it. Am I saying that's everything? I am not. I think that when we speak in all or nothing black and white terms about a complex subject such as infidelity, we're not giving it justice. But I do want to say I'm talking about from crisis to connection. And when it comes to connection, we need to learn how to stay connected through heaven and hell, through pain and through pleasure. We need to learn how to downregulate our partners when they are hurting. And if we don't know how to do that, our partners are left stressed, they might be more apt to do something different. Drink, or maybe use sex in some way to calm themselves down. If a couple is not uh, continually nurturing the adventurous part of their relationship, it might lead to one person finding another adventure, not blaming the person who was betrayed, not. Because anybody who has goes out of the marriage and has a secret, they had another choice. They could have reached out. They could have communicated. They could have reached out for help. But at the same time, since it's very complex, when a person is brought up in a family where they have not learned that they can reach out and tell their partner what's going on with them, or they can reach out for help, that suddenly that option doesn't even seem to be um, – um, an option for them. So again, walking that fine line between trying to give people an excuse, it's not an excuse, but there are reasons oftentimes, and usually it's because people have had some deficiencies in their growing up in terms of their connection to their parent in, in the case of being more and more of who they really can be and who they really are. And so when we get partnered, and the honeymoon phase maybe is over now, we don't have the experience or the skills to open up, to share, to stay connected, to thick and thin. So a lot of what I do with these couples that come see me is I help them begin to understand some of their deeper pains, You know, not only the things that happened that hurt them, but also the things that didn't happen that would have nurtured them. And then we somehow got to make up for that in the healthiest of ways. And then in the best of scenarios, the couple who has been through this crisis of infidelity, who understand these deficiencies, begin to make it up for each other. The person who was betrayed possibly might have had earlier childhood trauma too, so that this betrayal doesn't just trigger the pain of the moment, which is bad enough, but it might trigger past betrayals, past abandonments, past times of felt of, of being of feeling unseen or insignificant. Because for sure, when a person who was betrayed, who has given their heart to a partner, finds out 
through, uh, through a discovery that their partner has cheated, they definitely, one of the feel, experiences they have inside of them is I feel insignificant. I feel discarded. I feel like I don't matter. And if they had that earlier in their lives, it just compounds it. So we, we take this crisis of infidelity, which is true for any crisis, but I'm focusing on infidelity. And we begin to learn about how the two of us as a couple can down and upregulate each other. How I can listen to you when you're upset, even if I'm really upset, that we learn how to take turns, even though I really have a hard time doing that. Now, when I'm working with a couple uh, that there's been infidelity, I'm not saying that the person who's betrayed has to start listening in the first session. There's a lot of pain there. And I do kind of prioritize the pain of the betrayal, the betrayed person. Uh, they are the victims in this. They are the ones that didn't have the choice. They're the ones that weren't in the know. They're the ones that were blindsided. But even at some point, even the betrayed person needs to be able to see that if they're going to heal and flourish as a couple, that the betrayed person has to be able to also help regulate the partner's nervous system who did the betrayal. At the same time, the person who betrayed has to learn how to regulate him or herself in ways that honors their partner, no secrets, of course. And as they learn how to regulate themselves better, they are now in a position to be able to also help regulate their partner, which oftentimes they weren't very good at at all. One of the things, just as an example that I did, I had one person who would, uh, ha would not only do a lot of compulsive masturbation, but would uh, cheat from time to time, but, you know, it's way too much, more than zero is too much, right? Um, and one of the things he learned is how to upregulate himself. He came from a family where there was no stimulation from his parents. It was all about them. It really was all about them. Father for sure. Um, he was absent a lot. The mother was kind of needy. And this client of mine became the regulator for his mom and nobody regulated him. So when he felt that emptiness, what did we do? He would find it by uh, compulsive masturbation, ultimately cheating on his partner who wasn't always uh, happy with him, probably because he didn't know how to be there for her, let alone himself. So I, I, you know, among the things that that I helped him with, uh, besides what I've been talking about, is learning how to regulate each other. He had to learn to regulate himself first. He started to play the guitar more. He started to play in a soccer league. Um, he actually did. Uh, he he's a funny person. He he actually uh, for a little while anyway signed up to do stand up comedy. Um, found that his ability to regulate himself that way made it much easier for him to not use a sexual feeling to upregulate him. He was now free to find these other ways, but then also to not feel so shameful and guilty. And now he's able to connect with his partner because you can understand how there's a slippery slope, a downward spiral that happens with people. So um, his connection with himself is being able to tune in to what he needs, down regulation, up regulation, and do it in ways that don't dishonor the marriage, don't dishonor his partner freed him up to now be more of a regulated, regulated factor to his wife. He didn't, he shouldn't have been that person to his mother, but we need to be that to our partners. We need to be able to regulate ourselves to regulate the other person. The more we regulate each other, the, the more we're regulated, it all works together. And uh, learning how to listen to each other's pain, to learn how to not interrupt, like I said earlier, to take turns. And also uh, to create an adventure. It doesn't always have to be a physical, touching, sexual connection, but that is definitely a part of it. But to create adventures, even if it's a simple adventure of playing a game together in the evening and not just focusing on a screen, those are all things that, that I do with couples to help them do so that the person who betrayed becomes way more safe, more trustworthy.
And the person who was a victim of betrayal understands themselves more, the partnership more, realize, learns to trust intuition, his or her own intuition more. So it's always about connection, from crisis to connection again, right? Connecting to oneself, connecting to the other. And as bad as infidelity is, it oftentimes could lead to deeper connections, more healthy, loving, adventurous connections, and more communication. So that's what I wanted to say, everybody. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, I really love what I do. I've seen many couples who have been through this um, infidelity crisis come out the other side uh, thriving more than they ever have. It is not to say that you have to stay in a part in a relationship if you've been cheated on. So you've got to follow your heart. You follow your intuition. I'm just saying that uh, there are things to learn. We need to oftentimes come to this humble. Uh, we need to realize that oftentimes it's not about uh, evil. It's not. It's usually about attachment trauma. It's about that disconnection. How do we connect in ways that make it safe and nurturing for everybody? Thanks for listening. This is Todd Krieger, making the world safe for love.